Welcome back to the show. I'm Michael Bull, and this is America's Commercial Real Estate Show. Today, our topic is is multifamily market sliding. This segment is brought to you by Valuate Online Investment Analysis. Visit GetValuate.com to check it out. Our guest is Ryan Severino. He's Senior Economist with JLL. He's joined us here in Studio One. Ryan, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Michael. Always a pleasure. Well, Ryan, with multifamily, it seems like the biggest question I get from people is, wow, there's there's a lot of new new multifamily that's been built, that's being built. What do you think about supply for multifamily around the country today? You know, it's certainly at an elevated level. And I think uh, based on the research that I've seen, it looks like 2017 is likely to be the high watermark for construction during this cycle. And I think I know you've probably heard me and some others say that for the last couple of years, but it does finally look like this is where we're going to see sort of that big slug of, uh, of development come online. And I think it's, it's making the market more challenging. Uh, the way that I describe it when I'm, I'm out speaking about the market, talking to clients, is, is not to say, hey, the apartment market's dead, don't touch it, uh, mm-hmm. stay away. Mm-hmm. But relative to a few years ago, I think what people need to do is they need to do a little more homework, sharpen their pencils, uh, and, and be cautious because there is a lot under construction right now. And I think you're still seeing some interest. Uh, I think one of the things that, that is starting to tamp this down a little bit is it seems like the lender enthusiasm for apartments, uh, at least a lot of the lenders that we've seen in the last three, four, five years, uh, has cooled off a little bit. But I mean, just drive around most major markets and you're going to see properties under construction and cranes moving things around. So I think, again, the focus is on doing your homework. Understand the neighborhood, understand what's under construction, what could potentially go under construction, uh, and really understand the dynamics. Three, four, five years ago, you know, any project you built was probably going to be a home run. You had the wind at your sails. Uh, I think now you need to be a little bit more discriminating about uh, if you're going to do a construction deal. What does the submarket look like? What does the metro look like? What are the underlying economic and demographic drivers? Because we are further, al- much further along in the apartment cycle than we were three, four, five years ago. Yeah. And one of the questions I think that uh, my listeners and viewers might have for you, Ryan, is uh, affordability. I mean, as the land prices continue to rise, construction prices continue to rise, you really have to get some really high rents to, to build these new projects. And when I look at some of the rents and I do the math, it's like, all right, don't these tenants need to make like six figures to rent this apartment? How many are there? That's a really good question. And I think you, you really hit the nail on the head because if you look at the supply that's coming online, it's not, you know, sort of your average run of the mill apartments. It's a lot of this mm-hmm. Class A or A plus, uh, sort of top of the market, world beater caliber product. And to your point, there there really is a, a finite number of individuals in a given market that can afford that. I mean, even in the priciest markets in the country, you know, New York and places like that, there isn't this infinite pool of people making you know well into the six figures that can afford that. And so I worry about some of those because you're right. In order for to justify those projects, uh, when you take into account the the, the rise in land costs materials costs, construction costs, you have to get to a pretty pricey rent point in order to make those deals work. And my, you know, my thought on this is like some of these deals, um, they might not end up being complete disasters, but I, I think you're going to see some of them not hit their pro forma underwritten rents, either through concessions or through uh, a decline in the face level asking rents. I think the ones that are sort of um, you know, as I'm fond of saying, you know, they're a little late to the party when all of the you know popular people have gone home and the punch <laughs> has been drunk already. You know that kind of thing. Yeah. I, I feel like some of the the properties that are under construction right now will be some of those late to the to the party kind of uh, apartments, unfortunately. Yeah, well, that's a good point. I think you've got to look at the the future employment growth and how much wages will they be earning? Like, you know, we're in Atlanta, we're expecting a lot more job growth, but it's pretty high income uh, people with, you know, technology jobs and Mercedes just moved their headquarters here. Right. Um, another question I think a, a lot of people have is about the multifamily market. It's just had incredible growth. It's just yes. really been awesome. And I think some of that's been the demographics of the millennials. You know, you've had a, a large group of people that are kind of that apartment renting age is that, is that still continuing? How long should we expect that to, to be a boom to multifamily? 
What's interesting is I feel like we've been talking about millennials seemingly forever. Maybe like even before they were born, I feel like this conversation started. Um, here's the good news. The good news they is... They like it, though. <laughs> as, you know, as long as you compliment them on it, though. Um, I'm kidding, of course. Um, if you think about that generation, it's still a relatively young generation, even though we have been talking about them seemingly you know, forever. Mm -hmm. um, the, the three most common ages in the United States right now are 25, 26, and 24. And that's because the bulk of the millennials were born 25, 26, and 24 years ago. Even though the generation probably started somewhere, you know, sort of circa 1980, mm -hmm. it wasn't really until sort of, you know, kind of the early to mid 90s when you really saw um, the number of births, you know, really start to escalate to the point where um, it wasn't on par with some of the, you know, the big baby boomer calendar years, but at least it, it's in that conversation. So you think about that, right? The, so the big crux of this generation is still kind of mid 20s, which puts them squarely in the prime rental cohort. The median age of a first-time home buyer in the United States is still about 31. So just based on the median, that gives them a good five, six, seven years if they're going to think about transitioning. And honestly, in some of the, the really expensive markets, that median age gets pushed out a little bit further because it just takes longer to save to come up with a 20% down payment if you're in a you know New York metro area or a San Francisco metro area, something like that. So I think you know we probably have at least that long um, before we have to worry about them transitioning out of, uh, you know, sort of being the dominant renters into uh, into sort of that home ownership transition period. So I don't worry so much about the demand side of the ledger for the apartment market. It's really just a question more on, I think, the supply side in certain markets. And, and to be fair, you know, supply isn't, you know, really universal across the country. We, It's more of a concentrated phenomenon. You know, some of the big Texas markets, even New York, places like that, you know, you're seeing significant increase in supply, but it's not as if, you know, all of the top, 80 or so markets are, are, are seeing sort of the same level of, uh, of, of supply growth. I think right. it, it clearly varies uh, according to market. Right. And you mentioned homes and the housing market. So what do you expect moving forward there? I mean, it seems like it's a lot harder to, to get a home loan than it used to be in the, the go-go days of the, of the breath test. Uh, you have some talk of uh, interest deductions maybe being uh, pulled for uh, second homes, which could impact uh, home values. Uh, what do you expect moving forward for the housing market and its impact on multifamily? You know, I think the underpinnings of the for sale market are still pretty strong. I think the big thing um, that's been holding the market back, at least in terms of volume, is just there's not enough supply out there. And I think some of this is due to the fact that the apartment market had such a good run for such a long period of time. Um, I think there were a lot of lenders that got and investors that got burned pretty badly with for sale housing in the last cycle. And, that, and a lot of the small builders are gone that built homes. Yeah, and <laughs> they, they just they, they just backed out. away from the industry. Yeah. Yeah. And, and rightfully so, I get it. Yeah. You stick your hand in the oven, you get burned, you're a little reticent to stick it back in the second mm -hmm. time. Um, but I think what you're seeing now is a lot of the, the, the real serious appreciation that we're seeing in, in, in for sale housing, which is pretty universal across the country, um, is owed to basically a supply demand imbalance and, and 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 not so much at the high end I, i'm not so worried about you know million plus homes you know you know missing a pool of demand or something like that it's really sort of more transitional housing entry level to to above entry level where if you look at the inventory levels in some respects they're lower than they were during the housing bubble and so it's one of the reasons you're seeing this fairly significant appreciation uh, you know i'd like to see um, I'd like to see more supply growth there. I'd like to see more um, interest on the part of the developers and interest on the part of the lenders. Um, but I think it's been I think it's been it's been a challenge for them, no doubt. And this appreciation in single family home values is is that really uh, a benefit for the multifamily investors because their tenants are going to stay tenants longer? I think so. I think yeah. it, you know it, the way that I look at the housing market is it, you know there are two pools of demand. There, mm -hmm. there tend to be Younger people, like we were talking about, sort of the prime rental cohort, kind of 20 to 30 year olds, tend to not be homeowners, tend to be renters. Above that median home ownership age, 31, primarily they tend to be owners, not, not renters. So you go from being renters at a younger age to owners, there's a very strong positive correlation between age and home ownership. But around that transition period, there is definitely a pool of people that make that calculus, that they decide, you know, do we stay renting versus uh, transitioning to being homeowners? And I think 
all things equal, the more unaffordable it is and the harder it is to find a house that you would actually wish to purchase because of limited inventory to actually make that transition, then what happens is it ends up elongating that period of time uh, where you see some people staying in their, in their uh, apartments longer than they otherwise would. So net-net, I think that tends to be uh, a benefit for, for apartment landlords because it probably keeps their tenancy a little more, a little stickier, a little more resilient than it would otherwise be. Yeah. Well, I think it's also interesting the stigma is gone. I think if I told you I was renting a nice apartment in Atlanta, you'd say, oh, good for you. You're not going to have to cut the grass this weekend, right? right? You wouldn't say, oh, Michael, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> you must not be able to afford a home. Um, That's so, a good thing, too, though, right? Because I think, yeah. you know, it, we're one of the few countries in the world where I think there is that strong perception that way, that stigma associated with it. There, there are a couple others. I won't throw them under the bus. But if you go to... To Europe, a lot of countries in Europe, there isn't that perception, and mm -hmm. and there isn't this sort of one monolithic European, uh, you know, sort of housing market. But in a lot of countries in Europe, more people rent than own because there isn't that stigma associated with it. And I and I think that's a good thing. I think we getting past that stigma in the U.S. and letting people choose, you know, sort of their their mode of dwelling, mm -hmm. whether it's renting or owning, it should just be a function of you know what suits them well, yeah. not a function of um, you know sort of social stigmatization or anything like that. Yeah, some people might not want to cut the grass. So maybe just call the landlord when the refrigerator <laughs> breaks, right? So, Ryan, before you go, where are some opportunities for listeners and viewers related to multifamily today? You know, I love everything that's below the institutional radar in multifamily. So class, let's say, B plus to B, um, and even further below that. Mm -hmm. I think um, I look at the market and I see inventory declining over time. I see demand not just steady but increasing. Um, I see price points for a lot of these assets that you know more sophisticated, really competitive institutional investors are not going to touch because it's just not going to move the needle on their portfolio at all. Um, you got to do your homework on these deals. They're not all layups. You really have to. I think the capex part of it really is important because some of these are older assets that were built in the 70s and the 80s and they've been neglected for a little while. But I think you know if, if you really do your homework and you avoid the ones where there's just going to be this kind of money pit caliber CapEx sinkhole, I think there are attractive opportunities there, not just to buy, I think, at attractive cap rates and, and have a stable tenant base where, where the cash flow looks good, but also to do what I'll call sort of smart remodeling or remediation where you can do things at the margin um, that don't cost a lot of money, but where you can actually generate some rent increase and get good bang for your buck, I still think there are a lot of opportunities out there because uh, if you go back and you look at the last 36 years of data, there's only been one calendar year in the last 36 years where Class BC apartments had a calendar year rent decline. So the stigma or, or, or the knock on it is that you can't, you can't grow rents as quickly as you can in Class A, but again, if, if you do your homework, you can actually find properties where they're uh, there's some upside there if you're you're smart about you know doing renovations that aren't aren't you know costing you a ton of money and you get a lot of bang for your buck there. So I'm still really enthusiastic about about Class B C apartments in the U S. Well, that's a good tip, and I think there's a lot of opportunity there for better management. I mean, you think about Class A management companies; they're all pretty good and. There's not a whole lot to right. do differently, really. But when you start getting into B and C, your management skills can really make a difference. There are some assets, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you firsthand, that I've seen where, um, this is going to sound like a trope, but true story. Um, the asset was owned by a widow. It was her, her husband who had it for the longest time. She inherited it after his death. Wasn't doing very much, at, if anything, with it. Was actually using a couple of the units as basically her own sort of self-storage units or property <laughs> self-storage units. And yeah. I'm sitting there thinking, that's thousands of dollars a month that you've taken offline from revenue and NOI. Um, it's being totally mismanaged. And I think, you know, an investor comes in and, and sees opportunities like that. Those are the ones, again, where you kind of have to do your homework and understand what's going on. But I do think there are opportunities there for things like better management, uh, better CapEx you know, planning and things like that. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm trying not to, to overstate it, but uh, I'm still very uh, bullish on the outlook for, for BC apartments, not just until the next recession, but I think even medium to long term in the U.S. Yeah. Well, that's where I started with selling apartments, you know, when I was 19 years old. And by the time I was 22, I was selling apartments, uh, commission only broker. And I had a management background of turning apartments. So 
you know, it, it's like my head of the apartment group now I have, you know, he, he, he's turned around apartments. And so when you can come in and kind of see opportunities, I think that is a great opportunity to buy B and C. And as usual, great information, Ryan. Thanks for joining us. Always my pleasure, Michael. Thank you for having me. And thanks for joining us out there on the radio stations, iTunes, YouTube. Hey, please comment, please share on Facebook, LinkedIn, connect with us. Thanks for being with us. And until next week, be sure that you always lead, learn, and laugh and join us for the Commercial Real Estate Show.